on the call that needs an introduction, I'd say, is myself. Um, we have Andy Morn from um, an intercounty player with Mayo for many years, now an intercounty manager with Leitrim GA. I have the infamous Amber Barrett. Um, I suppose we all know her from Irish soccer. I remember Amber from her GA times. And we've Carl Lacey joining us all. So Carl just having a little bit of technical difficulty. He was in with us, but he's gone out to join us with another laptop. So I suppose just to give you a little bit of the format of today, um, I suppose here at ATU Donegal, we are trying to recruit for our MSc in sports performance practice. It's the fourth year of running this programme. We have applications already in, but we've extended the deadline slightly because I suppose running this programme, we need sufficient numbers to do so. And we're just looking for a last bundle of applicants to come in to be able to progress on with um, running the programme. So you're all very welcome today. And I suppose the reason we kind of done the format the way we done is for people to kind of be able to understand, like we can explain the programme to use and you know by, by by introducing the modules and all of that but no better way to show you how that's put into practice than by professional people who are working in this ma market so i will give a bit of a broad overview very quickly at the end of this about the masters but i suppose we want to use very effectively th these people's time on the call to explain how professional practice works within the different disciplines of sports that they're working in so I maybe if you don't mind, Amber, I might start ladies first, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. um, we'll start off with you. And, and again, just to reiterate my congratulations on the recent World Cup campaign. Um, I'm sure it was an amazing experience being part of the first Irish squad to qualify. Maybe, Amber, if you don't mind, by starting out, giving everybody in the call here a little bit of insight into the preparation for for the World Cup that you've participated in. Mm -hmm. And how did you as a team um, prepare to deliver on those big performances? Um, firstly, thank you very much for your for your congratulations. It's, it's still very much appreciated. Um, I think, you know, most people think that the, the preparation started the camp that we went into before we flew out, the four or five weeks before we flew out. But I think realistically, the preparation started from the day after we qualified last year in, in October. So... I think it's been a long process in that regard that we had, you know, we had a camp in, in November, which wasn't initially planned um, because we had, you know, I think used a lot of the budget to get us a long camp during the summer for two very important games. And I think the fact that we were able to get that in November was a very, very good step for us because it probably was the worst camp we've had in terms of, I suppose, the hangover of Hamden, as we called it, was still there. And you know, we managed to get that out of our legs. And, you know, thankfully then we went into February, February, April, we had two camps, one in the States in April, and we played in Marbella in February. And I think those were two brilliant camps to introduce people into the squad. Players that were on the fringes were given more game time. And I think that was a big, I suppose, an audition for many players. But I think, you know, initially then we went in very, I think we were one of the earliest countries to start preparing. We went in, I think, around the 12th of June. Um, and it was a long time until the, the 20th of July, which was our first game from then. It was nearly six weeks. Mm -hmm. But I found that we had two very, very important games at home against Zambia and against France. I think the Zambia game more so was... Vera's way of trying to nail down who she wanted to be in her final 23 and you know I think it was a very interesting um, camp in in that process because usually we go into camp you're in the squad there's 27 players selected 26 players selected you know there's always a very positive you know mindset with everybody everybody's very excited but I think going into camp in June was a real eye opener because the pressure was massive there. You know, we went in with maybe 30, 32 players, but only 23 were going to be selected for the main squad. So I suppose you could say from day one, the tension was very high. And I think even until we played the first game, I don't think that tension ever left because at the end of the day, people wanted to be one of the players, you know, representing Ireland for the World Cup squad. And I think that's... Um, you know, you talk about high performance, but in a way, a lot of people looked at it as a difficult environment. But I think it's very healthy because competitive environments are what ex exactly what you need 
and you need people to be you know you need the, to be a little bit of anxiety around because if people aren't anxious it means that they think that their place is secured and yeah, I think complacency, compla- com- complacency mm. creeps in then so I think it definitely was a very long build up period and unfortunately like everything we build up for the experience lasted in the blink of an eye and it felt like we were prepared for years <laughs> yeah and, t- and tell me I suppose you're referencing there a lot of the camps and then I suppose the build up and then it's the games coming quite quick one after the other I suppose I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on where sports science plays a role in all of that and I know you've had your team there you know coaching and all of that where does the sports science play a part in your view in all of that well I suppose one of the the most important staff members that we have is a it's actually a Karen Donna woman called Neve McDade and she is our uh, representative from Stat Sports and is kind of our sports analyst and she looks after all the all the data from games and training and even pre-camp you know, we have to report our minutes to us, you know, if we have any issues, we report it to her, she passes on information to the physios. And I suppose it's, I suppose it's a big buzzword around, you know, football now, but it's loading. And I think it's very important thing coming into that, where in previous camps, we've been lucky, we've been in with our clubs, up to the point that we travel, most of us play a game the day before we meet up for camp. Whereas this was the first time that we went in on the back of a summer break, players some players had finished playing the end of April so they had maybe nearly six weeks of no club training up until that period so I suppose it was very very important for us to manage that when we got in and I think we were very lucky in in the World Cup that we had one I think one muscular injury over the whole period um, I think you know that's that's a testament to the work that the coaches had done you know and I think it's at times you know, as players, there's definitely sessions, and I think Andy, you'll agree with us that there's days you come off the train and thinking, Jesus, we could have done a wee bit more, but then there's other days where you think, God, we did a lot today. So mm-hmm. I think it's about it's trying to find the healthy balance, and balance. I th- I think in a in a healthy environment, you know, if players don't want to keep playing when you're doing your small games at the end of the session, I always think that's where the the most fun is. And I think that we were able to strike a very good balance between that. And I think the injury statistics um, speak for themselves. Very interesting. And and I suppose a curiosity question, Amber, in terms of the preparation there that you're mentioning representing Ireland, does it differ much in the context of the club now that you're playing for? Is there much difference in terms of S&C analysis or, or are they all at this level now? I think it's I've definitely experienced a variety over the last years I've spent four years in Germany and now this is my first year in Belgium and I find that everywhere you go you meet different coaches who have different ways of doing things and I think that's I suppose it's an interesting way of dealing with it how things were dealt with in Cologne at the start when I was there are completely different to how they were dealt last year in Potsdam in Germany so I think that they're moving in the right direction. I think women's football still has a way to go in terms of actually nailing down that relationship between S and C, sports science and coaches. Because I think, speaking from experience, a lot of the coaches that are involved with female football are coaches that you know worked previously with men's football, and I think that they're trying to get used to that kind of switch over of what worked 10, 15 years ago doesn't necessarily work these days so I think we're trying to kind of bridge that gap a little bit but I think it's definitely a very interesting dynamic how even though you I've had you know I can I can only say that I've worked under really really good athletic trainers in my in my time as a professional footballer but every single one of them had a different way of dealing with it some enjoyed that the second day after a game was free because they said that's the day you feel the most lethargic after a game Others insisted it's best to train that day because you're nearly kind of getting rid of everything that's left. And me personally, I think it differs every week. Some days it's better to have the Tuesday free and then other days you get the Wednesday free and you feel much better for it on a Thursday. Um, I think a lot of the questions that we have, we won't have answers for right now, but I think it's definitely it's definitely improving and going in the right direction. 
brilliant. Thanks, Amber. And look, at, I suppose just to all the participants in the call, if you have any questions, feel free to put in the chat or we'll give you that opportunity as, as we work through the, the different panellist members. Andy, I might just move over to you now, if you don't mind. Maybe um, for the purpose, I suppose I want to kind of draw on your experience because you obviously own and manage your own gym as well. So do you mind just giving people in the call a quick overview in your background from playing to managing and running that gym? Yeah, so... Um... Firstly, thanks million for inviting me on. And Amber, I'm sure you've heard this a lot over the last while, but I have an eight-year-old girl here. Um, we're going to Dublin on the 23rd of September to support the ladies. So I think it's when the World Cup kind of fades away and people say, Joe, the, the impression you've had on young kids, we were on holidays in Portugal and I'd watch every minute. I wanted to watch them anyway, but my little girl was watching every minute of the game. So thanks very much for that and the opportunity you've given little girls. It's um, it's amazing. I look forward to seeing you playing on the 23rd. So um, yeah, myself, I'm Andy Moore and I'm approaching my 40th birthday in about two months time, I'm unfortunate to say, but um, I was lucky enough to play for Mayo from 2003 to 2019, which was amazing. Uh, went to IT Sligo, went to Jordanstown, both with, with Carl, who who hopefully will join us in the call later on. Um, Joe, as you were saying there now, I'm manager of Leitrim. I'm into my just going into our third year. We've two years done. And uh, and on the professional side of us, we we own three gyms. We um we've 20, 26 staff, and uh, I just see a course like what we're we're here to talk about tonight as being Joe, the most amazing opportunity for people to work and to participate in education at the same time and I, I just think it's an amazing opportunity and you can be the best Amber was talking there about SNC coaches and uh, what I find with coaches and people who work for us it, it both in the gym and in the football side you can be the best SNC coach in the world but if you don't have the skills to connect and liaise with people and to develop them relationships I, I don't think it's worth it so there's really is a balance to both your education and your personal skills. And I suppose you're, you're, you know, you mentioned there are 26 people working in your gyms. From your experience, and, and now as an county manager, Andy, how important do you feel it is to have the right people involved in your setup from everything from like what we're talking about, S&C to nutrition, et cetera? How, how important is that? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's definitely a learning that I'm getting. You, you think you know from being a player um, as a footballer, you think you know being a uh, like you know who's right and who's wrong for setups, but you don't really know what's going on in the management setup. And when you when you cross that bridge and you go into management setup, you then realise, okay, just because they're all agreeing with you, that doesn't mean that they're the right people. You know, you really have to get the people who are going to question you, but question you in the right way to to get it going. And I I notice that in work. Now as we speak, we actually have a real fabulous team working for us at work. And that wasn't always the case over the eight and a half years we've been open. We've had people there that just were good people, but just mightn't have been the right for our brand. And that's the same when you get into football management or into any team management. You need to get the right people. You need to really question who you're getting in. And you need to question is, why do you want them there? And if all them, if you take all them boxes, I think uh, uh, the right thing, and I, I think it's a great thing. And I, I, I do think as well, if you if you don't ask them questions, if you haven't the right person and you panic and go for just a person to fill a gap, I think that'll always come back to hurt you. And I've heard, learned that the hard way in every walk of my life, but especially football management and, and in work. Andy, Donald, I might actually even get you to put the link for the programme into the chat now for people to kind of maybe start even looking at the modules in the programme. But Andy, one of the features of this programme is that People, uh, the minimum, minimum mentor requirements, people need a level eight in sport. But if they don't have that, experience counts. So we review applications based on, you know, people's exposure and experience to the field of sport. I suppose from your practical experience um, of both on the field and in your gyms, well, how important do you think practical experience plays in terms of a person's career in this area? You know, be it that they work with sport and teams or be that they work in gyms, etc. You know, where do you see the balance between practical versus academia is what I'm, I'm really asking? Well, I think to get yourself um, moving and to get yourself in the door of a lot of places, you need the academia to, you, you know, you need the academic side to, to get going. But then you're building up your 
practical uh, knowledge right throughout your years. You, you had a guy on a, a webinar, and I encourage everyone that listens to this to check it out, but you had Barry Solon on a webinar a couple of weeks ago, and Barry's a personal friend of mine. We come from the same town, and Barry is the head of S&C for Arsenal senior men's team uh, at the minute. And the amount of work, Nicola, he did while he was studying, the amount of like freelance work he did just going into teams, building up his experience, getting to know his network, getting to know how to deal with maybe a soccer player, a rugby player, uh, a Gaelic footballer, and all the different demands them teams have it. Also, uh, Amber was saying there about the, the female side of the, the game. We have Catherine Sullivan, who's the old lady's captain working for us. At, and her needs are different in ways to the needs of, uh, of a, a male athlete. They're, they're just different in, in terms of just the, the female uh, structure of the body. They, like we, we all know about the Bira, uh, the Irish international coach was very on about ACLs and the damage and the, the, why it's so much prevalent for girls to get ACL injuries. So they have to vary the training. So the sports science side of it and having that knowledge over years of, of training is absolutely key when you get into uh, the, the sporting side of it. And sorry now for dragging on, but me, no, from no. A personal, me from a personal level, I was 19 when I started playing for Mayo. I was approaching my 36th birthday when I finished. And in that time, I was a student probably drinking too much alcohol, try to play. Then I was working, probably driving too much. Then all of a sudden I started getting injuries when I was approaching my 30th birthday. Then all of a sudden we were mad enough to decide to have a few kids. And all them things, you need to have a different structure to your training. And you need to have an SNC coach or somebody that can develop your training around your different stages of your life. And I think that's one of the key elements for longevity within sporting players. Yeah, if, if you could just bottle the magic formula around that. You actually referenced Barry Solon there juggling work and, uh, you know, still doing study. I suppose just to, for participants, again, an important component of this pr programme is that we've an applied research project or slash dissertation. So it really allows people to kind of put into practice, you know, practically what they're learning so that they've something useful at the end of it um, and, and be that in what, in what, for whatever employer slash organisation you work for. I'm going to... Nicola, Nicola, can yeah. I come in on that actually? Because yeah. I'm just watching the promotional video you have on your site as well. And uh, his name escapes me, sorry. Um, but he, he sure. was on about, he, yeah, he was on about helping um, or going in, working with the Donegal Academy. Now he's working yeah. with the Modern Academy. We're lead, like us, Leitrim Football, who's not, not too far away from Letterkenny. We're looking for people to work on the sports science side, read the GPS systems, help in the SNC people who can monitor our fellas that are in Dublin. Joe, we're always looking for people and every county team is looking for good people to come in and join their team. So it gives you a huge opportunity to, to do that. Yes, you have to work for free, but the experience you get and the knowledge you get from working with people who have way more knowledge is just is second to none, you know? Yeah, and actually Donald has posted that article um, from an alumnus there on the chat. Carl, I'm going to bring you in, I suppose, just for the people, for purpose of the people in the call. Carl is actually a lecturer um, on our Sports Performance Practice Masters. He's one of a great team. I would absolutely boast that, along with Ken Van Summeren, Ronan Doherty and Maria Faulkner. I suppose, Carl, just following on from Andy's point that he made earlier around having the right people with the right qualifications, um, you know, as part of a team, you have a knowledge of the MSC. Could you even just identify some of the some skills, of the, skills that, the that the MSC looks at that you can link that you can link, link it, to, it the to the program? Yeah, absolutely. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's fascinating there to hear Amber and Andy's story. Well done on both of your careers. Uh, keep up the good work, and a uh, very happy birthday to you as well, Andy. Can't believe you're forty. No, I've uh, two uh, months left. Two months left. Two months left. Two months left. Yeah. Uh, listen, I think, yeah, like, obviously, like, you, knowledge was one thing there. We spoke quite a bit there by um, Amber and Andy in relation to, you know, all the specialised areas in sports performance. So your strength and conditioning, your performance analysis, your sports nutrition, your physiology um, of exercise. That's, there's any amount of that on the master's program, okay, led by really good people, really good um, people that have huge experience in the area from both an academic point of view and a practical point of view. But I think one one area that stands out, I think, in this master's um, is 
again, it was alluded to by Amber and Andy, is in relation to professional practice in a high performance environment. And that's the piece, I think, as, as students and you go into sports science and you go to learn and you, and you gain all the knowledge and you get the bit of practical experience in undergraduate, I think that's maybe where students might fall down when they get their first job in a gym or to get a fir their first job within, within a team or a, or a high performance um, athlete. I think that professional practice is something um, that uh, students might lack or never kind of really thought of or never kind of learnt um, through, their, through their study. And it's something we really focus in on with our students on the master's programme. And that's back to even Amber was talking about there about camps and she was talking about the tension around the camp and there's 32 players within the squad and there's only 24 players that are, are selected by the manager or the coaches but you as an SNC coach you as a nutritionist you're you're part of that multidisciplinary team and you have got to deal with that disappointment you've got to as a professional in that setup you've got to deal with that tension around the camp and around the environment and same with Andy about the building relationships, the planning, the organising, buying into the culture, maybe that Andy's creating in Leitrim. Being able to understand that, you know, being able to understand that the standards that are expected by both the management team, the support team, the players, and being able to buy into all that as well. So well, the point I'm trying to make is that, yes, the knowledge will be gained on the Masters. You, you, know, you have your specialised areas, but that professional practice is key um, in relation to you know, going in being ready, being ready to go in and apply what you've learned into a high performance, whether it's working with teams, individuals, athletes, and so on. So I think that's one that we, as, as a group of lecturers, we, we try to focus in on. Um, and we try and get them, get them ready. And, and Andy, you spoke about, you spoke about that student that did it last year, Shane Porter, who did the masters and he actually ended up with Mon and GA doing his work-based learning project. At the end of the year, and they actually ended up standing in Crow Park and all there in the semi-final day with eighty thousand people, you know, in, in a dressing room with high pressure, and um, with a group of lads that were going out to making and doing all Ireland for the first time. And there's one of our students ready in terms of professionally being able to handle himself, being able to deal with players, and that's not anything to do with the nutrition side of things and knowing knowing about nutrition. It's just that that characteristic and having the right being prepared. And being ready for for them scenarios like you know so um that's something i just i think it's it's, it's worth noting yeah and Cal, yeah, sorry, sorry i am, I am putting you on the spot, spot here on this, here on this with, with question is, is, is interference just, just to my side, side or can you use your me okay okay there's a bit of interference here yeah yeah, yeah. We'll just have we'll a just, just, just while i ask the question if that's all right Carl, what I was going to ask you there. I think it might be, yeah, yeah. if Carl just Carl mutes, mutes, because I think he's, I think using, he's using the audio on his phone, phone, but that's what it is. Sorry, Carl, I'll ask the question and then what I was going to ask you there was, and I'm putting you on the spot with this question, I'm asking you to perform feats of memory. Have you got another one or two stories from not naming names, but where a, a participants really kind of found a journey for themselves after completing the programme or during completion of the programme without naming names, but given just examples where the programme brought them? Uh, yeah, so we would have had a, um, a PE teacher um who would have joined in on, on the course part-time um, had a very high interest in performance analysis and did the course obviously it's not just performance analysis only you have your your um other subjects there but really wanted to focus in on performance analysis who used their dissertation or used their research and um, based around um performance analysis only and ended up working with a, a senior club team um, in one of the top club teams in the country, actually, who will be very successful and um, ended up in, in that environment as well and doing really well. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose the reality of these situations, I suppose what's important to point out, Carl, is these kind of individuals wouldn't have got that experience without the exposure or because of what they'd attained during the Masters. Carl, the last question, and then I'll open it out if anybody has any gen general questions. But for the people that are on the call here that might be interested in taking part in this course, what advice would you give them, Carl? Um, listen, 
I know everybody's in a different situation. Um, some there might be some un undergraduates who's, who's ready to go into a level nine. There might be some people, um, as you said, that don't have uh, a level eight in sport, um, but have huge experience. There might be people here who haven't been in college in fifteen years. It might be a very daunting uh, thought going, going back in. So I know there's uh, people are in different scenarios and there's different things running through people's heads. But I think number one is reach out. I think we're very as a group of lecturers. Um, and, and staff and ATU you were very approachable and that's one thing even if you do join the course you know we get to know people very well and um, on it there's a really strong relationship that's built and um, with with our cohort of students so if you're if you're unsure if you have more questions reach out I was in that situation myself I was in business studies uh, I worked in the bank and didn't enjoy one day of it um, and I decided to go, go for it at nearly 30 years of age uh, I went back and did my master's in sports performance in, in Limerick and, and I haven't looked back since you know so if you have any passion for sport and um, if it's something that you're thinking of reach out reach out we'll might not have all the answers for you but we'll guide you and help you as, um, as, as much as we can and I say we're very approachable and we'll do everything we can to make sure that you make the right decision. And on and that on note, that. I have put um, email addresses for both myself and Keith, a colleague of mine. If anybody has any questions in the masters, feel free to come through. Now, I see Fintan, you're typing. What I will allow now is if anybody has any questions or even Andy, Amber, Carl, if you have anything else you want to come in on, I would will give a, a very, very short synopsis of the programme before we finish the call. But over to yourselves, folks. These are very interesting people and it's not every day we have them on the call. So any questions from the floor and hopefully Fintan you're a fast typer <laughs> yeah Andy I just wanted to just ask you a question there based on obviously coming from a player background to now going into management um, I suppose the way that especially strength and conditioning is moving now we all it's it's like it's nearly the most important thing you see the county teams are starting back early but they always start back first with the strength and conditioning before they move on to the rest how do you manage, I suppose, the different, I suppose, needs of players? You know, not every player needs the same type of training or, you know, access to the same type of training. So in a group of, what, 30, 35 players, how do you make sure that you're getting the best out of every single player going into a game at the weekend or training during the week? Yeah, I, I'm not sure, Amber, I'm highly qualified to answer that question yes I'm hoping to be um, I'm definitely still on the the learning curve of um, of management coaching it, it like to me I love it because it's so fascinating because it changes every day but like I've had very very good mentors um, as I said Barry Barry Sona was a has been a friend for all all my life I've seen him coming through seen him how he worked me when I was a player um, like my need when when we had Charlotte, we Charlotte in 2014, I was coming off three absolutely substantial injuries and my career was as good as over and they just kind of adapted and changed stuff around me just to, to get myself right. But we do the same things in in Leitrim, even though it's a younger squad, we would, I just feel everyone comes from a different background. Um, everyone comes from a different background. So some guys, you'll have the green guys that come in. And they just want to train and they want to lift weights and they want to get better in the way they go. But you'll have other guys that don't want to come back into November, December and kind of start mm -hmm. them, start to go back. So there has to be a balance struck. So for me, it's more on the personal side of it. What do you feel like? Where are you at? We've we've one young man who's had his first kid there in the in the last couple of weeks. So how do we change it up for him? Can we give him a bit of time off? And then I really do rely on S and C coaches to say, right, okay, this guy has has had a shoulder injury, this guy's had a back injury, this guy has had multiple hamstring injuries. How do we kind of fix that? And the next, to be honest, Amber, you've, you've asked the question at the right time because the next three, four months for us is going to be key because in mm -hmm. 2023, this season just gone, we had a multitude of injuries right throughout the, the course. Was in Leitrim, I feel that for two years during COVID, we kind of just stopped and now we're trying to get back on it. And it kind of caught up on us last year where we got too many injuries. So this year, we're going to have mm -hmm. to adapt for every single person. And I think Alex Ferguson once said was, what is sports science? He, it's getting your best team on the field as much time as you can, as much as possible. And we have failed to do that in the last two years. So in year three, we're hoping to get that a tiny bit better. 
folks, you, anybody can unmute if there's any questions from the floor and not delay it if necessarily. But has anybody got Marie, Amy, Fint, I think Finton's dropping off. Gary, any questions for Andy, Amber, Karen? No? No, I'm fine. No, no, it's very that's good. That's all so. right. Well, folks, before we just conclude, if that's all right, just a very and Carl, if I miss anything, feel free to come in on this, certainly. Um, we've already alluded to the fact that I suppose the difference of this program is very much the overarching, you know, you're dipping into various different modules from data analytics to performance analysis to NSNC to sports nutrition. So you're getting a wide window, like was pointed out by Anne Brandy, you're getting a wide window and all of that professional practice to set up. So on, on the link that Donald provided, it gives you a link to the programme, which goes through all of the modules, and that gives you a sense of what you'd be covering within the programme. I already mentioned that uh, sometimes a hesitation for people in relation to a master's is the dissertation. We give people the option of both. So that's obviously one third of the program, like most typical masters. Um, and the great thing about that is you can apply it to something that's relevant to an organization or an association that you're involved with. So like Karen mentioned, if you have any questions specifically around the content, feel free to reach out. Keith and I can be a buffer, but we can direct you to the relevant people that we think might be best suited to answer your question. Another big USP, and Andy, I see you coming in there. I'll, I'll, I'll just mention about the delivery schedule and come to you then. Another big USP of the programme, which hasn't come up right now, is the delivery schedule. Um, this is predominantly an online programme, but there is two days on campus a semester. In actual fact, that's probably, and Carl will probably back me up when I say this, our Previous participants would really praise these days because they get to put into real practice stuff that they've been learning online. But the pressure is not on you to attend every single lecture online every single week. All sessions are recorded and can be listened in the car, on a commute, whilst at work, at a time that's convenient for you. So that's a really, really important point because I suppose we're all probably in this call, we're all juggling family, life, work, you know, and trying to do a master's in the middle of it all. So I suppose just to point that out, Andy, you were going to mention something there. No, Nicola, sorry, just on the gym point of view that we haven't mentioned, but what people forget, so our gyms, for example, we specialize in giving classes, so spin classes, strength classes, and um, whatever, like all aerobic classes, whatever. But what that gives you, it, if you want to go down into the sport and element, but you haven't got the confidence yet, you have to stand between, in front of, as a male, probably 20, 25 females looking back at you, and you have to deliver a good class, encourage, develop all the varying levels of, of uh, abilities within the class. So even doing this, getting involved in a gym-based setup will give you the confidence then to move along if you wanted to go that route as well, as you know? So this, as you said, the academic side gives you the input to go and work within a setting in sport, but it also gives you a, 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 a facility to work within a gym setting as well, which, which is huge. And if you're a PT or you're a class-based coach, the amount of stuff, personalities you have to deal with is amazing. And you just deal with the same personalities in sport, but just probably at a higher level. Yeah. And funny, Maria, I heard he just came in there with a point around career. I think she maybe is just asking regarding career opportunities. So you've already given a nod to that. And Carl, feel free to come in. But in the, in the two years I've been involved in the department, I suppose people have gone into the areas of performance analysis. They've gone into the areas of coaching. They've gone into the areas of working with, with governing bodies. I don't know, Carl, if I'm missing any others, but Carl already alluded to the likes of PE teachers. They're going back to their school and putting an infrastructure in that regard. Am I missing any clinkers, Carla, in, in, in that space of space career, career opportunities? opportunities? I think education and um, there is, is a big one. Uh, we see the gap there for like PE teachers now who have been maybe in schools for the past 15, 20 years and now that curriculum has changed. You know, it's gone very sciencey um, now, so we find a lot of teachers interested in coming back in and, and upskilling consultancy work for people that want to set up their own businesses and their own nutrition clinic um, even in coaching or as you say like performance analysis or whatever um, and there's a lot of that type of work that, that happens within as well and one just two points I want to make um, before we go here is 
within like over the previous whatever four or five years this course has been running and there's been huge diversity on the course in terms of cohort of students so it's not your typical classroom full of Gaelic footballers or soccer there's been you know, really some really interesting students and, and backgrounds like from individual sports to water sports to team sports and um, there's been i think a dancer um, within the group as well and believe it or not us as lecturers have learned from um from them as well in terms of their sports and, and different things that, that goes on in their environments and stuff as well so that's that's really interesting um, as well and there's loads of learning in that and then the second one is We'd be very, we're very keen on getting guest speakers um, from a wide range of sports uh, across the world um, in, in our classes that you're not listening to us lectures all the time. It's very much you know, a two-way system between the student and the lecturer, but then we also get a, a third party and a guest speaker around certain topics, and that's gone down really well with past students as well. Um, so, yeah. Are you trying Are you to get Amber and Andy? They're current. current. <laughs> Andy, he was looking for students. Will Andy, we have any mountain for you? Down, send a couple down to leave them. Just let us know what you need. So, folks, so just, folks just to wrap just... up. Um, You've got all the detail there in the programme. The course fees are listed. They are It's 5,750. There are scholarships available at ATU. So for anybody that maybe isn't part of a team, like there is GPA scholarships, etc. But if you're not, you know, part of that GPA, there is the other opportunity at the Push and Boundaries. Donald, even if, if, if you can find the link for the Push and Boundaries, I think that's up to about 2,000 euro for participants to go towards to subvent the fees. So, you know, and, and that can be for any candidate that ticks that box at the end of the application form. So the application process is, folks, that there's an application form on the website. You fill it out. It's, it's really two pages with personal detail. There is a personal statement requirement there to fill it out. Um, and then we will be able to know if we can make a conditional offer or if a person needs to go through that um, RPL, the recognition of prior experiential learning piece. Um, so just, I suppose, keep in touch if it's of interest to you. We are looking for applications to come in as quickly as possible and um, so that we can get into the order of business, which is commencing the programme. Thanks very much. A particular massive thanks to Andy and Amber for giving of their time on a Tuesday evening. If we can ever pay you back, let us know. Carl could be calling you as a guest speaker. <laughs> Um, thank you, everybody else. And I am to Amy, Maria, Abdullah, I think you've just joined. Thank you as well for joining us. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thanks very Thanks much. Very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.